Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to this talk on inflammatory disease of the small bowel and mesentery. And first, I'll just discuss a couple of pertinent points that revolve around the protocols, things we've spoken about before, that uh, oral and IV contrast become very critical. Question is positive versus neutral oral contrast material. Typically, we always like to use IV contrast, and we like to inject at about 5 cc's a second. When we use positive contrast, we use oral Omni 350. 100 cc's of Omni 350 in a gallon of water works very nicely. There are a number of good reasons to use positive contrast. If you're looking for a leak, for example, in this case of a pneumoperitoneum, it's much easier, and it may only be possible to find the leak with positive contrast material, as you can see in this case from the images. If I'm looking for a fistula or communication, you're going to use positive contrast material. If you can't give IV contrast, you're going to use positive contrast material. If you're looking for just a routine follow-up in a patient with abdominal pain or a history of malignancy, positive contrast works nicely with IV contrast material. If we're looking at the vessels, or we're looking at perfusion of organs, looking at the kidneys specifically, the liver specifically, the pancreas specifically, the spleen or adrenals, then I will use water only. Also for dedicated small bowel examinations, water seems to work very nicely. Water also gives you the uh, mucosal enhancement, so you can see the bowel wall better. You can see the vessels going to the bowel wall. You can see the perfusion and enhancement of bowel. So in this case of Crohn's disease, on the axials, you'll see fiber fatty proliferation of the mesentery. You see some prominent vessels. And then when you go to the coronal view, you see the full length of involvement. You see the stricture. You see the abnormal enhancement of the bowel. You see the increased vasorecta, which even shows better with the MIP imaging. We see the prominent vasorecta, which I put a square around. And you see the increased fat in the mesentery, so-called fiber fatty proliferation. The prominent vasorecta, a classic for active inflammatory bowel disease and typically active Crohn's disease. So that works very nicely. People have used volumen. Uh, volumen, uh, what it does is it brings water into bowel. Uh, so in a sense, it gives the patients diarrhea. Some of the patients with the methylcellulose can get severe diarrhea. Volume was very popular. There have been a number of articles speaking about its use, but it's become less popular. It's fairly expensive. And in our experience, in the majority of cases, water works just as well. Now, when we do dedicated small bowel imaging, whether it's for malignancies or for inflammatory disease or ischemia, we call it CT enterography. And there have been many articles. This review by Elise Says made the point that it's a very good way of looking at bowel. Now, one thing I should mention, as I said, I like to use water and IV contrast. There's a big push these days from the ER docs to eliminate any oral contrast material. Uh, they say that by not giving oral, it decreases the length of stay, and it doesn't compromise our accuracy. There's been articles like this one from Levinson or this one for Alabusi that uh, in their studies, the benefits of prompt imaging outweigh the unlikely need for repeat imaging by not giving oral contrast material. That um, this other article says, in patients with a body mass index over 25 to the, presenting to the ED with acute abdominal pain, CT can be acquired without oral contrast without compromising the clinical efficacy of CT. There have been articles like this one for appendicitis Abdominal CT without the use of oral contrast is accurate. In our series, no patients required repeat scanning. Now, it's my opinion that you can often do things without oral contrast material, but it's silly. You don't need to keep the patient around for two hours. Give them water, distend the stomach, distend the proximal small bowel, and then scan the patient. The other logic is that you're giving IV contrast. Everyone's going to give IV contrast. And so when you give IV contrast, there always is the risk of nephrotoxicity. It's a small risk. The main thing tied to the risk is patients who are dehydrated. Well, guess what? If you give the patient's PO contrast water, you're hydrating the patient. It's not going to be an issue. 
We give water. It does not slow things down. There's this craziness with ER docs about not giving PO contrast. A number of articles have come out, but we're the ones who read the study. It doesn't delay anything, and it makes the studies better. End of discussion, in my opinion. Also, as I said, it's a safety thing. You're giving IV, give oral. Okay, in terms of IV, depending on the scenario, we'll either do dual phase imaging or single phase. Single phase might be arterial or single phase might be venous, depending on the scenario. And we'll cover some of those scenarios. We talk about the scan parameters. Since we're going to do reconstructions, we like thin sections, 0.75 millimeter thick sections. Every 0.5 millimeters works very nicely. Be it a 64 slice scanner or anything beyond 64 slice scanners, those parameters seem to work very well. We have made the point and will continue to make the point. When you're looking at areas like the bowel, it's not just axial imaging, but you need the total armamentarium from multiplanar to 3D imaging to really do a great job. I've showed this slide before, which shows you what happens with axial in a patient with Crohn's. Yes, I see the thickened bowel. And if I simply go to coronal, I appreciate the extent of thickening and the prominent vessels better. And if I go to MIP imaging, I really appreciate the vasa recta which means increased activity and active Crohn's disease. And when I go to volume rendering, I have not only the vessels, but also the strictures in the bowel. So a combination of volume rendering, MIP, coronals, and axials is the way things need to go. And let me throw in the sagittal to look at the mesenteric vessels. And you can see how you can put all of this together. So if you're looking at small bowel obstruction or suspected small bowel obstruction, where adhesions IBD, small bowel tumors, and hernias are the big four. But at the end of the day, it's adhesions that are going to be the most common by 75% of the cases. We need to answer questions. Does the patient actually have small bowel? Or are the symptoms related to something else? If there is small bowel obstruction, is it partial or is it complete? If it's small bowel obstruction, what's the cause? Is it a tumor? Is it a stricture from Crohn's? Is it adhesions? Or can't you tell? You can classify obstruction into simple or complicated obstructions, but you can see even with the simple obstructions, the patients may need to go to surgery. And remember, morbidity and mortality is directly tied to delay in operating. If you operate early, the morbidity and mortality is very low. If patients wait six hours, surely if they wait 24 hours, the percent of problems related to morbidity and mortality increases significantly. With untreated strangulation, fatality is 100% at 24 hours. Things we look at when looking at the bowel, we look for wall thickening over three millimeters, which means if the wall looks thick, if we can measure it, it's probably thick. We look for abnormal enhancement, which can be increased enhancement with hyperemia or decreased enhancement. Things like ischemia can be either increased or decreased. We look for malrotation. We look for abnormalities in the mesenteric fat. We look at the bowel loops. Over 2.5 cm, surely over 3 is going to be dilated. We look for what's called a small bowel feces sign, which are air bubbles and intestinal content appearing proximal to the site of obstruction. It's a really good sign for finding the trigger point of the obstruction. We look for wall thickening and we look for transitions. So in this case, you can see proximally, the water is the oral contrast agent, the bowel is dilated. We then follow it downward and we see what looks like feces in bowel, that's food matter. And you can follow it and you can see that as you follow it downward and up toward the right upper quadrant, you can see the transition point where the bowel is no longer distended, where the feces sign stops, and you can put circles around it. And this was the patient's cause of obstruction. This ended up being adhesions. There's no tumor present. There's no malrotation. There's no internal hernia. This patient had had an appendectomy years before, and this was the patient's reason. It was adhesions. Another example, this case, abdominal pain. Look at the small bowel in the left upper quadrant. It's dilated and there's ascites nearby. But look at its enhancement, or should I say the lack of bowel enhancement. You can see the bowel is distended. It's not enhancing. There's ascites in the region. That is highly suspicious for ischemic bowel. 
And in coronal view, here it is very nicely. Look at the bow loops. Look at that internal hernia. Beautifully seen in this example. The coronal show it very nicely. You can see the twist. That's an internal hernia. This patient went to surgery. The hernia was undone. And the patient was able to have the bowel successfully resected. Often you could potentially have the bowel not be resected. You could simply have the bowel uh, be saved once you undo the patient's volvulus or internal hernia. Another example, here's on the right side. Dilated bowel, you see ascites, which to me always means ischemic bowel in the right scenario. The lack of enhancement of dilated bowel right up a quadrant. Here's some more loops, and here it is on the coronal view, the internal hernia, the volvulus, classic appearance, emergency case, do not pass go, go directly to surgery. Again, you can see the value of coronal imaging, in this case, volume display in coronal imaging. It really makes it much easier as you scroll through the data set. When I look at axial images, it can be more difficult. Looking up and down actually can be a real challenge. It's hard to figure out transition points. In the coronal, it's much easier. You can follow the vessels, you can follow the bowel, you can follow the transition. In terms of some numbers, closed loop obstruction can be caused by adhesive bands or internal or external hernias. Bands tend to be more common these days. Closed loop obstruction can lead to a volvulus, which leads to impairment of venous outflow followed by arterial ischemia. Key things you look for are the C or U-shaped distended loops of within the mesenteric vessels, following them converging toward the site of obstruction. The site of obstruction usually is clear when you're careful on the multiplanar views. An example, look at these dilated loops of bowel which are enhancing despite a good injection. And where are those loops? They're between the stomach and the mesenteric vessels and pancreas. They're in the lesser sac. When you look at these images and you look at the uh, images within, uh, as you scroll through the volumes, it's very, very easy to be able to see exactly where the transition is and exactly how you can look at the vasculature and really understand everything. And you can see we've gone from axial to coronal to sagittal. And here it is on screen capture. Very nicely showing you the small bowel loops tracking through an internal hernia in the lesser sac. You see the engorgement of the mesenteric vessels. You can see the mesenteric vessels displayed and stretched. And you can see the dilated loops of bowel. Very nicely shown in this example. Classic study. Just a beautiful case. Or in this example, patient with abdominal distension, the small bowel is dilated. We follow it down to the inguinal region. And sure enough, here's an inguinal hernia, which is incarcerated. Or in this case, another example, you can see the dilated loops of bowel. You see there's a hernia. And with the hernia sac, you can see some free fluid. You can see it a little bit better here with the pinching of the internal hernia uh, through an inguinal hernia, that is. And this is classic for obstruction. This hernia will need to be reduced or this patient will develop ischemic bowel. Again, the transition point very easily to show on the coronal view. Here it is with 3D, very nicely showing you the hernia there. Here it is on sagittal display, very nicely showing you this again. And again, you can see it on axial view as well. So again, putting all the images together makes things a whole lot easier. Now, when we talk about inflammatory disease of the small bowel, we also speak about Crohn's disease. We talk about some of the findings from mucosal hyperenhancement to wall thickening to mural stratification with prominent vas erecta. We talk about mesenteric fat stranding. And so in this case, you can see with MIP imaging, the prominent vessels to the iliocolic region, the thickened and enhancing vessels very nicely defined. This is due to active Crohn's disease. You can see another patient with looks like a foreign body, which is really an enterolith in the small bowel. As you look at it in coronal, you can see the strictures, you see the enterolith. All of that is very nicely seen. CT is very good for looking at strictures, extensive strictures, as well as multiple strictures. Uh, you can see a case like this with dilated small bowel. Must be obstruction. This patient had a long history of Crohn's disease.
You follow it downward to the right lower quadrant. There's a transition point and thickened bowel. Now in this case, you would undoubtedly read it as Crohn's disease, thickened bowel. This patient needed surgery. Interestingly, on pathology, this ended up being a carcinoma in a strictured zone of Crohn's. Patients with Crohn's disease have increased incidence of carcinoma. Sometimes you can see a mass effect and you can make this suggestion. In other cases, it's just impossible. Even the surgeon palpating didn't see a mass present. It's only at times pathology where you may see a very small uh, zone of tumor present. Now, there's been lots of articles on CT enterography talking about its value in Crohn's disease patients. We do try to use MR as well, particularly in younger patients, and we kind of will rotate depending on the scenario what study is indeed done. Even in Europe, the European Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and organization do define the contrast. A CT, computer tomographic enterography, is the study of choice for defining involvement and extent high sensitivity, and high specificity, and again, the importance of multiplanar and 3D imaging. So I then wanted to cover a few more topics with inflammatory disease in the small bowel. Uh, there are many things we can speak about, but I thought we would take a few other topics that really put into perspective the ability to look both at the small bowel as well as at the vessels and one of the classic things might be to look at SMA syndrome. We can think about median awkward ligament syndrome where there's compression of the celiac by the median awkward ligament. But SMA syndrome is more classic in terms of bowel involvement and vascular involvement. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take a break? And then let's get started with the SMA syndrome. And we'll finish part two of two of this talk. Thanks very much.